Hey there, Omaha. Welcome into another episode of Restaurant Hoppin'. Omaha really, I think we've seen it undergo a barbecue revolution over the last decade. There were not a lot of awesome barbecue restaurants. Like, I don't want to call it a barbecue desert, but it wasn't great as recently as eight, 10 years ago. But that's really changed. There's a lot of a lot of restaurants and a lot of home smokers, food trucks, whatever it might be, have kind of come in the area and really kind of rejuvenated the barbecue scene. And my guest today is a guy who is right at the forefront of that movement, Blaine Hunter, the owner owner of Por- Porky Butts. He's an award-winning pit master. Now his restaurant is absolutely killing it. Blaine, you've been on the show before, but it was years and years ago. Welcome back. Seems like yesterday. Thanks for having us back. So you actually came on... Um, I have this January 16th of 2020. That was a whole pandemic ago. A whole pandemic. So ago. <laughs> it, it, it's been a minute and things have obviously changed for your business. And I want to talk about those. But first, in case anyone, someone listening to this is probably a major foodie and they probably know who you are. But if they don't, I'm going to, I'm going to humor you here. I'm going to run through just a couple of your credentials from the competition barbecue circuit. This was before you opened Porky Butts in 2019 2016 kansas city barbecue society world rib champion and overall champion out of 7,000 teams 2017 you won the american royal open the largest barbecue contest in the world you have overall won 22 grand championships in nine states and in your competition career you have competed in over 130 barbecue competitions finishing in the top 10 more than 65 percent of the time so if you had any doubt that this guy knows a thing or two about smoke meats, there you go. This is this is one of the experts. So I just want to start from a real high level and just ask something that maybe is obvious, but to you, what defines like elite level barbecue? I think quality of starting product. I think that's the the biggest issue with uh, some of the entry level restaurants and competition guys and just anybody that's cooking is they don't start with a high-end product. They start with a mediocre or a a discounted brisket. And I think if you start with a high-end product or not even a high-end, a a quality product that you'll have a quality finish. I mean, that's one of the biggest misconceptions in barbecue, I think. So what, what products does Porky Butts work with and how did you ensure, or how did you decide which product you were going to start with as you're opening the restaurant? Oh, I've been testing products for 15 plus years. And you know, we, we, we've evolved. I mean, like I started with one rib and I'm on my third different brand just by testing and, and, you know, just genetics change in ribs and, and we're buying a rib that's comes out of Nebraska and all our pork comes out of Nebraska now. So it's a, we, we, we start with a high product. We, we it's an all natural product. We start with a all natural um, Wagyu beef. We, we start with good product and, you know, cook it right and serve it right. And I mean, start with a good product and end with a good product. Mm-hmm. I know you grew up in South Texas and I did. there's all kinds of different barbecue styles. People are, you know, people will make their case for Kansas city style, for Alabama style, Memphis style, uh, North Carolina. So I'm just going to clear the runway right now and just clear the lane. Let you LeBron James <laughs> fly in for a dunk. What is it that makes Texas style the best in your opinion? So, you know, this is funny. We just had, I mean, James Hawk and I are good friends uh, that owns Jay's. Right. And uh, we were just having a discussion because he always says Texas style barbecue. But in Texas, there's like five regions of Texas barbecue and people get this misconception. They see C- central Texas, which is Franklin's and, you know, the offsets and just a lot of salt and pepper. But um, I mean, that's the, I mean, I would say probably the king of Texas, but that's what people are most known for. But if you go down the south, there's like this this Mexican influence barbecue that's burnt bean and and down in the valley that's just absolutely my favorite. I I just it's like a Tex Mex Mexico influence barbecue that is just killer. And it they're just I mean like there's a place in that burnt bean I was talking about in um, Seguin, Texas that on Sundays they're doing like barbacoa and smoked uh, menudo and things like that that are just blow your mind when you have it and. Right now, that's probably the hot food in Texas. But I mean, Central Texas is king. And and I think Texas barbecue, just because they, they take so much pride and it's more of a craft barbecue where Kansas City, I'm sorry, Joe and guys in Kansas City, but it's uh, it's all about profits in Kansas City and they're just mass producing barbecue. So, I mean, Texas, I think is king and will always be king to me personally. Okay, so tell me more about that craft. What about the craft in Texas barbecue makes it stand out? So when I say craft barbecue, I'm saying a guy that's, you know, he's 10 in a pit. He's not using 
you know, he, he, he's starting with a piece of meat. He's trimming it down to his specs and it's more of a craft. He's doing less amount of meat, but he's taking a lot more time and effort and putting into it where some of barbecue restaurants are just slinging out, you know, thousands of pounds of brisket a day. And it's just going to be the most consistent. It's very good barbecue. It's just not that Franklin's over the top, blow you away every bite barbecue. Mm -hmm. Now I know Porky Butts offers sauces. Yes. And they're very good, but I need to know where you stand on sauce because this is a, there is a dividing line when it comes to should sauce be on barbecue or does barbecue need sauce? Are there certain barbecue sauces that need meats more than others? Like, you can take that direction anywhere you go, but where, where do you stand in the great sauce debate? I, I leave I leave sauce up to everyone. I personally don't eat a lot of sauce. Like when I cook at home, I don't use much sauce at all, but I think America likes sauce. I think people like, I mean, at the end of the day, America's addicted to sugar. We like, we like sweet <laughs> on true. everything. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm appealing to the masses. I know there's the truest and the purest like myself that aren't huge sauce people, but there's certain meats. Like I think ribs, a good glaze of sauce. I don't want a lot of dripping all over it, but I like a good glaze of finished sauce on ribs. When I serve them, it's a better presentation. It gives enough, it holds that moisture in and it tacks up and sucks some of the smoke up. So we like to sauce certain things, but you know, we don't put sauce on our brisket. We do on our burn ins just cause we like a little sweetness cause it's so savory and has so much salt and pepper on it. And I think all that fat needs to be cut with something, but I, I mean, there's some meats that I think need sauce and some don't. I mean, or Turkey, I wouldn't put anything on it because it's as it's good so as it gets. moist, yeah, right. And I, I want to talk more about that turkey in a, <laughs> in a minute because that's it, it blows my mind, but but we'll get there. <laughs> the first thing that I am really interested in talking to you about though is competition barbecue versus restaurant barbecue. <laughs> so, and that, <laughs> Two that different animals <laughs> that response is exactly why. So, the first thing that people notice when they enter Porky Butts is just that smell. It just hits you right away. You smell that smoked meat. You know it's barbecue. Like, if you find a way to put that into an air freshener or, like, a can of <laughs> Axe body spray or something, like, you'll retire tomorrow. You don't ever have to cook another animal ever again. But the second thing is just the walls are lined with trophies and ribbons showing off your competition barbecue victories. But... You, you you are on that competition circuit for about a decade, then opened Porky Butts in 2019. And like you just said, two completely different things. And I think a lot of people, myself included, when the restaurant first opened and even in the first opening months, were just like, there's this awesome pit master who is opening this barbecue restaurant in Omaha. Like, and we were so excited. And obviously we had reason to be, but just kind of tear down the walls and talk about the things that people don't understand that competition barbecue and restaurant barbecue are not synonymous. I mean, you can obviously be great at both, yeah, yeah. but that doesn't being great at one does not mean you will be great at the other by any means. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and the biggest challenges, and I was just talking to Craig from sauce Moss on the way over here. And we were saying uh, the difference between competition barbecue and restaurant barbecue. And it's hard to adjust like in competitions, I'm cooking six pieces of chicken, six slices of brisket. I mean, it's to, if you give me one brisket and tell me to cook it, I could cook that perfectly a thousand times in a row, but to cook, you know, 3,500 pounds of brisket on a Saturday and, and get every single one of those exactly the same and, and as consistent as you can and hold it and get them out between 12 hour and, you know, it's, it's tough. It's really hard. I mean, it, it's hard for everybody, even guys that are doing, you know, for 15, 20 years. So, I mean, the challenges, the biggest challenges is, is, is in restaurant is, it's scaling. I think scaling is absolutely hard. I mean, to do what we did at the beginning, I mean, to open was hard because, you know, I was doing competition barbecue and I worked in restaurants, but then you, you, you know, you have a hundred people standing at the door and they all want barbecue at once and to produce that barbecue and consistently put it out. We struggled for the first two months and it, until you get the process down and get people trained to where, you know, I'm not doing every single piece of meat. It's hard. I mean, it's, it's really hard where competition barbecue, it's me, one smoker and a, a brisket and, you know, and, and two racks got, of ribs and six pieces of chicken. That's easy. And you've got what? 14 15 hour like how yeah. basically and some got, of those take multiple days yeah it, so the competition you get there on friday and you got till you don't tr turn in until saturday so and and it's all about getting as much flavor in one bite for six judges so i mean we can just we over overdo it. i mean we inject and we season and we dip and we season and then we msg everything before you turn it in so it's a i mean it's two different animals i mean i, I yeah it's great that i want all the trophies but really at the end of the day it doesn't 
mean anything for a restaurant. I mean, it's fun to look at when you're in the, you know, it's fun to look at the American Royal Trophy, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to cook a good brisk, brisket in the restaurant, you know, or turn out good turkey or turn out good ribs. You still got to produce. And just like all the other restaurants in town, if it doesn't matter what you have on the wall. It matters what you put on the plate. You mentioned those first couple months were kind of rough. How, how did you, even before you open, how did you ramp up and try and prepare yourself for, Hey, I'm not, you know, I'm not cooking uh, enough food for six plates for judges, but I'm cooking for six hours, you know, the yeah. masses of people. How, how did you kind of, you mentioned scaling is the most important thing. How did you scale up? It, it was hard. I mean, the first couple of months we were, we thought we were every day, it would just get a little busier and a little busier. And we, we, we never tested when I first, for the two months leading up to the restaurant, I was testing two briskets at a time. And, and, you never, you know how the smoker reacts with just a small amount of meat on there. But when you start loading, you know, you start loading 50 briskets on there. It, you know, you put that much meat in there. It slows the cooking process down. It adds moisture. You can't get the bark you want. You got to add more salt. You got to trim it better. You know, there's just, there were so many things. It was just a learning process for the first two months. And just, you know, I didn't, I wasn't that good at buying meat and until I, you know, I'm not saying I'm great now, but I mean, I know my meat now and I know how it's going to react. And I know what you know. each time of the year, I mean, meat changes throughout the year and, you know, based on what the animal is eating and what their feeding program was. And people don't, you, you, you know, that your stuff's going to be leaner when it goes, goes into winter because all summer it was feeding, you know, differently. And it's, and it retained because of the temperature outside. So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff I've learned in the last three years of owning a restaurant that I never knew when I first opened it. That's fascinating. Well, there's and a ton. I, I, I mean, bet. you could go on for hours talking about meat. And the meat science behind drop cooking. drop a couple other knowledge bombs on it. I would love to hear some of this stuff. Like to think that animals are lean. Like when you say that, it makes sense. But I would have never thought about that on my own. The animals are yeah, they're leaner at one at a different time of the year. What are some Absolutely. other like ordering things or or just things along those lines that you've learned? I mean, the brisket's probably the most challenging because I mean, it, you the thing I think some people do and they just buy from whoever you know, like whatever Cisco brings them or whatever PFG brings them instead of actually go into a like when snicker farms i went to their ranch i toured their ranch i toured their their processing facility i went to their feeding program i studied their bull and genetic program and we went through everything and we talked about how they feed out for 500 days and that if there's an issue when i call them and complain or i say this is not right it takes two years to adjust that because they feed them for 500 days so when there is an issue to fix it it takes a long time to fix it but we you know, when you learn a little more and you get to know the ranchers and you get to know the people that are actually, you know, raising the animals and then they, they, they can tell you a little bit more about the times of years and how the struggles and if it's a hard winter, if it's a hot summer, those make big changes in the meat. So, I mean, just learning that and, and just get to know your, your, your producer, wherever you're getting it from and know the meat and don't change. I mean, people change so easy. They'll just save 10 cents on a brisket or save 20 cents on the ribs and they'll change. And, I mean, consistency and size and how, you know, what animal, I mean, the pH level on pigs are totally different from company to company. And that makes a huge difference in cooking and how the moisture content is at the end. So, I mean, those are things that I think people need to take into effect when they're cooking at these restaurants and, and not just buy the cheapest rib made just because it's the same size and came, came off a pig. Gotcha. Yeah. Something that really struck me when you were on the podcast last time and, and you mentioned it a couple minutes ago, so I want to bring it up again is you talked about the difficulty that you had in letting go and allowing employees to yeah. do the cooking as well, or the, the smoking as well. And I, I mean, that that's something that's really tough because when people come into Porky Butts and something is served to them, they're not thinking about, you know, whoever might have smoked it, whoever might have played it, they're thinking, oh, this is Blaine yeah. who made this from Porky Butts. And sometimes that might be true, but a lot of times it might not be. You're a busy guy. You're not at the restaurant all the time. So to be able to hand that process off to someone else is something that, especially with barbecue, is so delicate and it's so dictated by feel. It's not yeah. just, hey, put this burger on for two minutes, flip it another two minutes, whatever. That's a really hard thing to do. Have you started to find a healthy balance in being able to teach those processes and, and let others kind of pick up the mantle as well? Absolutely. Yeah. That was probably my biggest challenge in the restaurant is, is a trust with my, my kit. And, you know, I have a guy in the kitchen that it just absolutely kills it. So I, the kitchen side is not as much, it's the, the pit room. The pit room has been a challenge for me. And I had a guy that was on early on and who left us and, and I had 
you know, 15 year relationship with him and we, we cooked together. So I had a lot of trust in him. And then when he moved on, I had a gentleman that I didn't think was ever going to, I thought he was just a great cook and I didn't know that he'd ever be a great pit master. And he's just turned into, he's a goofy fun loving, but he's a great pit master. And, and it was a lot at the beginning, teaching him to not use thermometers and times. And he'd always put a timer on some of them and in barbecue, every animal's different. Everything's different. And it, like you said, you, you gotta, I mean, this is your best temperature gauge is your hands. I mean, you got to get there and get in there and feel and touch and, and to teach people that. And then there's just trust them at someday. You got to just, you got to let them make mistakes. I mean, we've had a guy, a pit master recently that I've been training for three months and he wrapped the briskets wrong. And I had to throw 14 briskets away, which is, I, I'm going to tell you, it's a tough day, but it was a learning process. And he thought he was going to get fired. And I'm like, no, if you do it. You do it again. <laughs> we'll yeah, then issue. we'll have a conversation. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, he's done And I, at the beginning, both of them, I wouldn't have gave him a chance because at the beginning they were, they weren't, very, I mean, they were just real quiet. And then and now they're just, they're, they both just do such a great job. And, I trust both of them. I don't even, I used to watch the cameras every single morning. If I wasn't there, make sure they walked through the door and the meat was going on at the right times. And but now I trust them both. And they're both just as good as pit masters. And it, it, it really, if you're in the restaurant during the week or, or I should say even more in the weekends, I mean, they're going to be handling more meat than I will be. Those two are, they're doing the majority of the cooking in these days and they, they both do a hell of a job. How do you teach feel? You know, it, it, it took a while. I mean, and especially with the newer guy, I mean, cause he, he worked at another barbecue restaurant previously so to teach him my processes it's it, that's why i say when my manager's interviewing people i'd rather have someone's never worked in a barbecue restaurant that doesn't know anything about barbecue because it's easier to teach them you can just teach them your way and and and, and, and you just gotta you, you wanna i mean literally i i pick a brisket up and it's not about the temp or the time or anything it's 100 percent. we do it we pull our briskets on feel and it, it that's and it's just something that it took, I mean, me, I went in every single Tuesday with him for two months and we just cooked together every Tuesday. The rest of the time he was with my other pit master. So we were just teaching him touch and feel. And every time I, something was done, I'd hand it to him and he'd grab it and flip it over and touch it. And that's how he learned. He was doing, he, he, he was a pit master today and did a heck of a job. So yeah, it was hard. To, it's hard to turn it over in barbecue and it's not a trust thing. It's just, you know, I'm, I'm a control freak to begin with. So it's, <laughs> And it's just, you know, like you said, your name and your brand and everything's behind it. So, and you know, no one's as passionate as you are. So, but you just got to trust people and let them be part of the Porky Butts team. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Now let, let's get into a couple menu items and we'll, we'll just start with the turkey. <laughs> there are very few times I would ever go to a barbecue restaurant and order turkey. I mean, turkey can be f- fine. But like when it's presented to me alongside ribs and brisket and burn ends and sausage, I ain't never choosing turkey unless it becomes very highly recommended to me by someone. And pe- many people told me, you got to try porky putts turkey. And I did, especially on the sandwich. And I'm just like, man, if my turkey at Thanksgiving tasted like this, we'd be having turkey every two weeks I, just, I, I would put in that effort. So like, I, I don't want you to give away the trade secrets or anything, but like, how do you get that Turkey to be so suck it? Like this is a bird that's so off. And I know it's because it's mishandled, but it's so often just dry and yes. flavorless. And yours isn't like that at all. It's overcooking. People are just overcooked Turkey. It's, it's all about the times and temperatures, which I just said, nothing's on times and temperatures, but um, no, no. So our Turkey, we just, we're basically throwing our, our basic rib rub on it. And we cook it to a color and then we pull it off and then uh, we wrap it with butter. That's the key. <laughs> there you go. Butter. Yes. <laughs> we wrap it with butter and, and just finish it. And once we finish it, then we let it steam out and we just hold it till we slice it. It's, it's probably the easiest process we have in the whole restaurant. And it was, it wasn't even going to be on the menu, but I had a bunch of samples of it. Like I said, I think I told you before, my buddy's mom passed away and I had Turkey and I'm like, Oh, I smoked Turkey for a funeral. And I smoked Turkey and gave it to the family. And, they call me the next day and said, that's the best meat we've ever had in our life. And I'm like, really? So I smoked another one from my wife and she's like, holy mackerel, that's got to go on the menu. And next thing you know, and now it's got like a cult following. And we have all, it, it's funny because it's all the people that come in and eat it are barbecue guys. Mm-hmm. And they, it, it, it's not, it's like the competition guys. They come and eat barbecue and burn ins. And the two things in competition barbecue, no one wants to eat turkey and uh, burn ins. No one in competition barbecue wants to eat burn ends. So when you do competition barbecue, it's it's always so rich and and it's and burn ends are just they have so Very much fatty. fatty. It's just like the beef yeah. rib. They got a you can't eat a lot of that stuff and it's just 
it has it's so rich and and i think just people in barbecue just get tired of the, the burn in just because of the, the richness of it but i mean that's what i taste every morning when i get there i just try one to make sure they're on point yeah i mean quality control right every yeah, day you, you just have to burn in rib and uh brisket every morning usually when i get there okay well tell me about the burn ends because that's another menu item i want to highlight not that any anything else like isn't fantastic at porgy butts but like that when i think of porgy butts one of the first times i went there i remember having your burn ends for the first time and yeah it's just like these little meat cubes that are just so fatty and rich but also just delicious i mean how do you achieve that type of flavor yeah so we start with them i mean it's got a high fat content burn point of the the brisket and we cook them separately so that way we can cook them at different times and temperatures and we cook it over 16 hours and 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 we take it to just a basically a rubber tender i mean it's it's gushy in your hand and it feels like like almost a sponge and then um i mean it's a simple salt pepper and garlic process and we hit them with our little uh glaze sauce on them they're as basic as it gets but it's all that fat that we you know you perfectly render it and you get that nice bark on the outside that all of it combined together just makes a perfect bite, I think. Mm-hmm. Something that I love about Porky Butts, you can come in any day of the week and you can get an awesome rack of ribs, you can get brisket, pulled pork, sausage, whatever it may be, you can get it in a sandwich. But you guys are constantly switching it up. I would say like Block 16 is the special king yep. of Omaha. Master, not even a king. I mean, it's like a next level. Master, wizard, <laughs> Gandalf, whatever we want to call yeah, yeah, them. Yeah. You guys are probably like whatever the next step below is, you guys are right there because you're consistently putting out new specials. And I find that so interesting because yeah, like someone you even mentioned, like with the barbecue pit masters, they're probably not, even those guys who love meat, they, they probably don't want to eat meat every single day. No. But if you're going to continue to consistently get people in the door, you got to offer something interesting. And that's what you guys do. You've had barbecue egg rolls, barbecue oh, yeah. bon me. You've had, uh wagyu chicken today. fried steak yeah well, you had today, pozole today we, yeah, right well, yeah it's not just pozole we take and we smoke ribs we smoke them for about three hours we pull them and then we braise them in the in like a wahio pepper juice and and add all the tr- traditional pozole and it, it, it i mean it's so my head head cook he's he's from mexico and he's just he's got an amazing palate and he's a great chef in his own right and so he every tuesday i let him do some type of mexican barbecue fusion or and he, he loves doing it so i just let him run and usually i come to him because i love pasoli i love there's certain things i love and i'm like dude make pasoli make because he because we you know traditional Family mexican meal. food every single yeah. weekend we we're on the kitchen eating some type of taco or some type of meal and and he usually makes it and so we're trying to incorporate and i'm trying to get him to do a little more get a little more creative because he does some he does some killer stuff in the kitchen. He's a great chef in his own. I should have given you forty dollars to just bring a cup I, of that. That sounds so good. I right should now. have brought some. I didn't even know it was kosher to bring food. It, it's all good. It's always kosher to bring food <laughs> to me, but it, it's all good. It's all good. I, I can I can soldier soldier through. Yeah. Um. But I I want to touch on that the idea of specials. A lot of barbecue restaurants don't offer specials all the time. It's just it or maybe the special is very you know meat centric maybe they're just smoking a different type of meat or they're offering tri-tip or something like that you guys get creative and you you blast it out on social media you do a really really good job of it what's the strategy behind that why is that so important to you i just think it it, first of all it adds a little creativity to the guys in the kitchen a little excitement something different than the traditional barbecue and then we have a great social media company that's always i mean like they were there today shooting little quick videos and and different things and they're trying to push more and more actually you know earlier because like the block 16 i mean they got your mouth watering the night before and then the morning of and that's kind of when we went the end of the day we're just just piggybacking off of their success and what they do and do a great job of out there just uh being a little more creative and giving some people some more challenges and, and i've been throwing stuff i mean like the head pit master guy he's his brother was a chef here in oman he was he's been a chef at restaurants and he's coming up with some ideas and he's got one that coming down the pipeline with some smoked pork belly that sounds pretty good and i'm hoping it comes to fruition and we actually can make it happen can we tease that or is that still uh, too far no it's a little too far okay. to work but okay. yeah no it's gonna be fun i, I won't it, push you on it it'll we'll definitely just, we'll, we'll be looking follow porky butts on instagram on facebook porky butts barbecue and 
smoked pork belly. If that makes yeah, an appearance, yeah. we'll know. Well, the banh mi is with the smoked pork belly on it is always and a fan favorite. Fantastic. I know we get a lot of people request between that and the pastrami burn ins and the the beef rib. I I get more text messages, emails, and then believe it or not, that the cowboy burrito. I don't know how many people beg for that thing to be on the menu and it's just the most basic thing that usually if you see us put the cowboy burrito on and i, I shouldn't say this it means we have a ton of catering going out we want to get a special <laughs> out and it's real popular so we're like just throw the cowboy burrito on the menu <laughs> so for for people who haven't had it what's on the cowboy burrito yeah. cowboy burrito is uh chopped brisket macaroni and cheese um fried jalapenos wrapped in a tortilla and grilled it's it's really good. I mean, that sounds phenomenal. Maybe, yeah, maybe not the most inventive thing in the world. <laughs> yeah. It's basically just taking a bunch of things you already have on the line, putting them in a tortilla, grilling it up, and saying, here you go. It's so funny Thanks. because it, it it was really the first time we created it was I wanted macaroni and cheese and eggs and fried jalapeno. So we did that for and I ate it for a breakfast burrito. And we were like, my my because my kitchen manager makes these amazing like burritos. And I'm like, let's let's do a barbecue one. And we threw a bunch of stuff together and there it was. So I, other than that one and other than the Mexican Tuesday specials, how are you coming up with specials? Like, is it just kind of whatever fancy strikes you? Is it it's, customer requests? It's what a, is it? A lot of times it's just me being me or me watching a TV show or listening to a podcast and, you know, just coming up with something crazy. And a lot of times I have these crazy dreams. I'll come in and I'll say something to my manager and she's like, that sounds amazing. And that's, I mean, truly it's just, I'm, I like food and, I like I travel a lot with barbecue, so when I'm traveling, I eat a lot of different places, and I think that kind of stimulates the, you know, the cooking and the chef side of me. Is there a special that like stands out in your mind that you're really proud of, or like anytime you get to put it on the menu, you're just like, yes, it's blank day. I mean, I'd probably say the banh mi is probably yeah. is probably my favorite. I mean, I love the banh mi. I think it's one of the best specials we make, and the Mayan has always been a real popular one. The Mayan's a it's a challenge to make because it has so much on it, <laughs> but it's a, it's a real popular, it's a, and it's good. I mean, they're why eat both of those. They're really good sandwiches. Mm -hmm. I also, I got to ask you about the beef rib. <laughs> I mean, it like, I seriously <laughs> consider that like, if I see that far enough in advance to where I can like block off extra time on my work calendar, I yeah. will like, I'll schedule a meeting on my work calendar <laughs> so I can take a longer lunch and come get it. Because I know like you guys, I mean, might do it, once or twice a year like it's not a special that can come out all the time i think pricing has a lot to do with it i don't know uh, if it's yeah. just difficult to make but just kind of like what is it about that do you think just makes it so popular and also maybe just educate people like hey why aren't we running a beef rib special every weekend why don't you just put that on the menu why is it difficult to do so one of the reasons we don't run it every weekend and i don't want to sell my social media guy but they said that you know create if you offer it every single week it's going to it'll die down. That's true. And it, you create a buzz when you only do it so often, but the That's reason why the we, McRib isn't on the menu all the time. Exactly. And mm -hmm. then we just release it at different times. Um, we would do it a lot more. It's just, it, it is a pricing thing. And it, you know, those one twenty three A's are, you know, that's the premium. I could get the smaller Chuck rib, but I like the big dino bones and I think it just presentation is cool on it. And they're really easy to make. It's probably the easiest thing we make on the whole menu. So it's not a challenge. It's just holding them. And, and it just, I mean, I don't want to be, it causes my, my manager. I usually, we plan it two weeks in advance. I said, I'm going to do ribs on these days. And, and then she rolls her eyes and then they have to have a team meeting to bring. Cause it, it, we have to overstaff. We have to, I mean, cause it, that first two hours and it, there's always the guy that gets, so the guy that gets shorted, no matter how many we have, I can make a thousand. The guy that's a thousand and one, he's going to give me he's a one star mad. review yep. every single time. Yep. Not because he didn't get barbecue because he didn't get a beef rib. And it's like, you know, I almost, I told her, I said, maybe that first guy, that's the last one, just give him the free one next time as Ooh, a promotion. Yeah, there you go. It, but it just, it, it, it seems like there's always someone mad. There's always somebody that wants it pick up at five o'clock and we're usually out by 1120. <laughs> Cause I, I make a lot. I mean, I, last time I made four cases of them and they were gone and really fast. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I remember we have a group of guys at work who usually goes out for lunch around noon on Wednesdays. And I was like, guys, if and, and people were talking about, they're like, we should go do this. This looks really good. I was like, guys, we're going to have to move that lunch way up <laughs> if you want to have any chance of getting a beef rib. So, yeah, we got there at 11 and luckily we got some. And for those watching, I mean, when we're talking beef ribs, they're like, this is the amount of meat 
yeah. that we're talking, not even counting the bone. It is, it's, it's a pound of meat. We've taken off the it's bone ridiculous. and weighed it. It's over a pound of meat. And it's really rich. I mean, it's burning on a stick. I tell everyone. Yeah. Just a glorious bark, just fat running through. It's so juicy. Yeah, definitely something you should probably only have like once a year, yeah. but that one time a year you have it. My God, is it worth it? It's um, It'll be back next month. I will tell you that. Okay. I just talked to the guy about ordering some, so. All right. It will be back next month. I can't tell you what day, yet, but. Well, that's just one more reason yeah. to watch the social <laughs> watch media. Watch the social media. So. Um, now, you mentioned going to culinary school earlier, and I wanted to talk to you about that because you uh, you attended Johnson & Wales University and the Fox Valley Technical College for, for culinary school. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, because I might be completely off base on this, but my understanding is not a lot of pitmasters or barbecue restaurant owners are culinary school grads or have that background. What was it about your uh, education that made you want to take that step as opposed to just kind of staying in the barbecue lane? You know, you know, I, I, when I was a young kid, I barbecue with my dad and then I started working in restaurants and that's kind of what, once I got into the restaurants, like what drove me to go to culinary school. And then my ultimate goal, I was going to come out and work at a big restaurant in New York or Chicago. And, and then I realized that, you know, it's, uh, you know, you, you want to have a family and a life. And so it's kind of challenging to move all over the country. So, I mean, I've always had a passion for cooking. I mean, I, I grew up cooking in the South with my dad and barbecuing and, I love cooking and I love going to culinary school and right out of culinary school, I was a sous chef at a country club and I loved the experience there. Then I became a private chef and that whole time I was still barbecuing and cooking in my backyard. And then I had my dad's big thousand gallon offset that I I do special events on for Warner and big companies here in town. And then there was always that passion. And then one day a gentleman said, let's do competition barbecue. Actually, I was just at lunch with him today and he, uh, he was the reason I got into competition barbecue and that kind of fueled the whole live fire cooking, pit mastering. And, you know, I was always doing it, but I was never really doing it. And then when I started cooking, I, at first, when I started in the competition side, I almost put too much of my chef influence on there, you know, trying to do a little more, come up with a new herb instead of just keeping it simple and cooking good barbecue. Cause I mean, at the end of the day, that's what it is. And then through my success, that's when my brother and my wife and everyone was like, you should open a barbecue restaurant. You should open a barbecue restaurant. And that kind of drove me into opening the barbecue restaurant. So it wasn't really, I mean, I was just zigzagging a lot. I mean, I was always a pit master and I was always barbecuing, but I never was, never even thought about it as a career until after I won, after I won the American role, that was kind of the, my wife's like, you need to capitalize on, you need to, other people need to experience your food. And, you know, that's kind of when we took the big plunge in 2019. Mm-hmm. You mentioned that country club job. Was that the Green Bay Country the Club? Green Bay Country Club. Kurt, Kurt Fowler? Yeah, Kurt was my crazy. He passed away, but he was a crazy, I mean, the guy taught me more than any culinary school could have ever taught me. I mean, he'd been in the business for 30 plus years and just a greasy old line cook that made his way up to executive chef and pretty creative guy, just had some drug and alcohol issues and he always had challenges in life, but he was just, I mean, he was as smooth as cook as I've ever been around. He taught me so much in the catering and, and, and actual restaurant business and gave me my first real job. I mean, I was in culinary school, gave me a job as a sous chef running a fairly large country club. So, I mean, it was a, it was a big deal. You know, I was the youngest guy in the kitchen and I was in charge and I, I owe a lot to Kurt. I mean, Kurt's kind of, he was a guy that kind of actually believed in me and gave me a chance. Well, how important was that for you to learn not only the culinary side of things, but to be in that leadership position, I mean, to, to have to lead that large group of people, I assume yeah, that's been huge now that you've opened your own place, being able to lean on the principles that you learned back then. Absolutely. And in a, in a country club setting is very challenging because we had get college kids in working with, you know, guys that have been in the restaurant business for 20 years and which is a very diverse group but uh and we also had we had we had a, a cabana we had a pool cabana we had our, our 19th hole we had our fine dining dining room we had our casual dining room and and to take all that on and have all the different groups and lead them all as a you know i was 22 years old and i got guys that are 40 and 50 that are you know i'm trying to lead and then also with 18 year old dishwashers and it was challenging it teach you a lot and you learn a lot on your feet and and it helped a ton, you know, opening the restaurant because it, uh, without that, I think that two years of the the country club, I don't think the restaurant would have ever been successful. 
How do you, when you're 22 years old and you're leading people who are 30 years your senior, how do you earn their respect and get them to pay attention to you and listen to you? I think you just lead by example. I mean, that's the biggest thing in the restaurant. I think, I mean, people get in there. I mean, you get over there and you just take over the line and you just show them the right way to do it and 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 the proper way to do it and to show them the efficiencies and, and just help them. I mean, that's the biggest thing in, in the restaurant business. Like even my restaurant now, you know, there's not a job that I haven't done as the dishwasher or the busser. And I think people respect that. And I think people, when they see me or my wife in there, you know, washing dishes or busting tables or working on the line or my wife, two weeks ago, I walked in the kitchen and she's loading the smoker with one of my kitchen guys. And I think just things like that, I think you, you, you I mean, that lead by example. I mean, that's the, the easiest way to, you know, lead someone, I think, is just show them the proper way to do it and do it side by side with them. Mm-hmm. Now, you mentioned when you got on the barbecue circuit, there were areas where you had to kind of dial down some of your chefy tendencies. Yeah. But were there any things that you learned from from culinary school, from working at the country club, from working working in restaurants that you feel like gave you an upper hand or an advantage when you joined competition barbecue? Yeah, some of the food science. I mean, there's stuff and stuff I probably wouldn't even mention here that I still do this day that guys that have been doing competition barbecue for 15, 20 years that don't even know, and I'm still teaching them. But there's a lot of that type of stuff that, you know, things that you can scientifically create a smoke ring and you can alter pieces of meat to make it add moisture to it and things like that, that I think you learn in the, the food science side of culinary school that, you know, the average barbecue guy just goes out and, and there's different things that we were doing. That's just totally different than the average guy. And I think some of that's starting to you know, get passed down to the newer generation and the learning curve and competition barbecue is, is not as great as when I started. It's like, it's a half a year now because there's so many classes and so many online videos. And there's a, there's a group, a national group that even I'm part of, we teach uh, online class and people pay membership to, and guys have signed up for that or they're winning right out of the gate, which is, it's great, but it's, it makes us old greasy guys a little, <laughs> a little bitter sometimes <laughs> that we had to learn on our own for two years. I feel that. I yeah. Feel that. So when you made the decision to leave competition barbecue and open a restaurant, was there a piece of you that was like, man, I, I really love this. I don't want, you know, I, I want the restaurant. Like I'm excited about the restaurant. Not that you weren't, but was there like a sad part of you? Like you were, and I know you've gotten back into competition barbecue, but that you were temporary, temporarily, temporarily, <laughs> jeez. Keep going. I no, like it. <laughs> don't, don't edit that out. I want people to hear my struggle. Uh, temporarily closing that door. Like w- was that difficult for you to do? You know, at first I, I was trying to do both. And then I, I went to two contests and I struggled bad because I wasn't prepared. I went there on short notice. I didn't have the right meat trimmed. And back to that, make sure you start with great meat. Um, so, I mean, I was trying to do both. And I realized that, that I need to step away from competition barbecue for you know, a while and just kind of step back. And, and I knew that at some point I was probably going to get back into it. But competition barbecue is one of those things. It's like a golf swing that you know, it's, it's a doneness game and it's a feel game and a diamond game in the competition barbecue. So you need to be doing, it's a repetitive, you have, I mean, the more you do, the better you get at it. And if you're not doing that 20 plus contest a year, it's hard to be that, you know, top 10 pit master in the world. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm so competitive. It's hard for me to just like, you know, right now I've been, I'll do one every four or five months and it's just, I've had some success and I'm still, you know, finishing top fives, but it's, you know, like I got 400 congratulations on the last fifth place finish and I was throwing stuff in my trailer and I was done because I was so mad and my wife's like you're so competitive and I it's just it's that you know that competitive blood in me and it's hard and I I, I don't want to get back into competition barbecue until I can dedicate if I can go to a contest and dedicate three days of just prepping and getting ready for it and, and, and being fully prepared then I'll go but if I can't then I cancel a lot they've actually started calling me B.O.B. back out Blaine because if I'm not fully prepared to go I'm not going right yeah, you don't want to go on half ass. No, you, you if can, you're gonna man. go, you're gonna commit to it fully and no, yeah, put your best product forward. No different than you know, loping and practice, man. You don't go play on Sunday and not practice all week. Mm-hmm. I mean, Allen Iverson could do it, but Blaine can't. <laughs> Allen Iverson's a special breed. <laughs> yeah, yes. Uh so you mentioned it's like a golf swing. It takes a little time to get back into it. So take me back to June of twenty twenty. That was your return to the barbecue competition circuit in the back to Mayberry competition in Rodney, Iowa. It's your first time competing in 14 months. What was it like getting back in the saddle? It was, uh, 
it was a little challenging at first. I mean, there was little steps that I missed, but only I knew that I missed them. But and it was a little challenging because I don't Ryan Cooper, a local booty, he actually went with me and documented the whole thing. So now, oh, I, I read his report. That's, oh, that's where I'm getting some of this information. Yeah, so from. it was like, you know, it's, there's no pressure like getting back into the barbecue after a year off. <laughs> somebody's and then, analyzing and then somebody's everything you're doing. Taking at pictures that knows barbecue and knows. So it was a. Uh, it was great and it felt good. And and you couldn't have had a better ending than winning the contest. And with, uh, the, I mean, there were, you know, Joe and there were some big name people that were chasing points at that time and were there. And so it's, you get back in and the first time and you hear your name called last and, you know, you walk away and get in the trailer and say, I still got it. And, you know, you, you don't want to be cocky, but you are cocky at the end of the day. And so, but I mean, it was, it was a great, great fun. I mean, experience and, you know, my wife and kids were there helping me. So we had a good time. What was your motivation for, getting back into it and specifically entering that competition oh my son is a, he loves barbecue i mean my we're going to a couple contests this year and it's strictly just because my son wanted to go um i i put a pool in and, and if i get any second off now i want to sit by the pool or relax or hang out with the family and now my son is he's 16 and he loves traveling he, he likes getting out and meeting people and he's actually a great help he, he run pit and he helps me with the barbecue side and so he he, he He's pushing me to go more. And uh, so just spending time with him alone is always worth it. I want to take you back to your very first barbecue competition. <laughs> and that's the response that I was hoping for. I don't remember where I read it, but I read somewhere in my research that it didn't exactly go as well as you hoped it did. Oh. But clearly something stuck because you didn't quit. No. You kept coming back to it and you kept perfecting it. Tell me about that first competition. So the first competition, so it was... I think it was 2013. It was January 2013. The gentleman that was with lunch today, Rodney Felt, he called me and he was just begging me to get into competition barbecue. He wanted to do a contest. And he kept asking, kept asking. And I happened to go into Valley one day and I saw a flyer for the Valley, which is my hometown, contest, barbecue contest. And I called him. I said, let's sign up for Valley. And he's like, you're serious? And it was like two months before. I said, let's sign up for it. So I signed us up. I started doing research and everything. He goes, are you ready? I said, dude, I'm ready. And I, he goes, what do you got? I said, I said, I had all the meats lined out. I had an idea of, you know, like turning boxes just from the internet stuff I've read. And, you know, he'd, he'd done it for about a year, but he wouldn't, you know, he was more about the drinking and partying. And I was more, I don't like to lose is my biggest thing. And we did some research and we got there and we showed up and we had my dad's freaking thousand gallon offset. I had two green eggs. We're cooking two briskets, six racks of ribs and two chickens and four pork butts on, I could have cooked thousands of pounds of meat with the, the amount of weapons we took to this contest. And I, it took us three loads of, to get all the crap there. And we prepped everything. I had everything going, everything I thought was perfect. And we turned it in and I, I thought everything looked good, tasted good. And my first rib box looked really good. And we are, I think we finished 21st out of 40 teams. And I was so mad. We didn't get a call that I said, he goes, so you think we'll do another one? I said, yeah, I signed up for next weekend and in state center, Iowa. He goes, he's serious. I said, we're going to go until we get a call. <laughs> so literally the next week, we, the next day, we were already prepping for the next contest. And and we got a call the next contest. And that, was, that was it, man. It was just a, once you get that first call, it's an addiction. Yeah. What would like, was that the competition where you knew like, yes, this is it. I'm in this. Well, that was a contest that I probably should have done a little more research because back in the, so when you're chasing points, guys will, find like doubles and what is chasing points so mean? like in in the kcbs team team of the year race which is there's usually about 30 teams that are chasing to be the top team in the country and what they do is they um they take your top 10 so your top 10 contests so that you get a point for whatever you finish so if you finish first you get 250 points plus how many teams are in there so you a max of 285 so basically the top 10 contests you do that year they put that point scale and that's your points champion just like any other like nascar and everything else mm -hmm. um so they do double. So people try to get as many contests in in a weekend as they can. So there was a stop off. There was a Friday, Saturday in state center. Iowa, and then there was a Saturday, Sunday, just over the border in Minnesota and all. So there was 27 teams of this contest in state center, Iowa. We get there and it was a 22 of the top teams in the country. And I didn't know anything. I didn't know who any of them were, you know, and I'm sitting there. I, that's the contest. I met Darren Worth and I met lucky Q and there's a bunch of guys that were just like the who's who of barbecue back in the day. And they're all there. And I'm looking around going, we didn't belong there. It's like, it's like literally this amateur guy showing up at the all-star game. One of these things. Hit BP like the and it's other, like, yeah. Yeah. It's like, 
but we we competed and we got ninth place in pork and we 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 beat half the field and that was that was it man it was from that point on we were i cooked i think eight contests my first year and that was the and then the second year I, I started taking a little more seriously in 14 and we started having success and then 15 my wife came to me and said why don't you you're spending a lot of money why don't you let not party as much and drink as much and then in 15 <laughs> at the end of the year I, I won the last three contests of the year and we rolled into 16 and that's when we had that amazing run and one team of the year and which i never intended to go for team of the year it would just kind of happen so yeah, yeah. That's, that's competition barbie you know we've learned a lot yeah. in this conversation yeah i think that this has been really revealing and i thank you for just having some great answers being so forthcoming i do have some barbecue quick hitters oh that i want to hit you with before we get out of here one barbecue meat for the rest of your life what are you choosing to eat or cook eat to eat i'd probably say smoked chicken chicken i know really i did not see that coming it's a mild meat and it's not real rich and you can do you can do everything with it i can take chicken and turn it into a taco i can smoke a chicken and just eat it plain or i can deep fry it and put a crisp in on it i mean there's a lot of things you can do with chicken it's a mild meat it's i'm ver- a thigh it's guy versatile. i'm okay. a leg thigh guy i'm not a breast guy. oh yeah you gotta have the dark meat. yeah people who take the white meat on a turkey i will never understand no. we're yeah. unless you're having smoked turkey at porky butts barbecue <laughs> yes <laughs> That, that's the only case where it counts. Um, outside of Porky Butts, best barbecue experience you've had in your life? A burn bean, without a doubt. Not it, it, It's 10 times better than my restaurant. I mean, what he's doing in Seguin, Texas, is it will absolutely blow your, your mind when you go there. It's, it's every single meat, every single dessert, every single side. That's experience. Ernest Cervantes himself. I mean, he's... He's a finalist for a James Beard Award this year, and not many barbecue people ever even nominate, let alone win it. And he deserves it because he's an amazing chef and he's an amazing talent. And it's by far the best restaurant. It's one of the best restaurants I've ever eaten, let alone barbecue. Okay. Uh, how do you balance your palate and what you know to be great barbecue with your customers' preferences? <laughs> That's a that's not a quick hitter. That's a that's a hard one there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because what what I personally like and what I'm trying to appeal to them, I because I mean at the end of the day I'm trying to hit a, you know, a driver or a wedge right down the middle. I'm not trying to stray too far off the sides. I mean just a nice basic mellow smoke flavor, a balanced salt, a balance of you know of of, of, of sweetness, and so I mean I'm not a huge fan of some of that stuff, but I I I just try to appeal to the masses. And just put an even, consistent, consistent, consistent barbecue. Not mm-hmm. the best in the world and not the worst. Just consistent, quality barbecue. Mm-hmm. All right. You talked about this a little bit earlier when you talked about how the animals change throughout the year and using different products affects your processes. But how often are you experimenting with just time, temperature, uh, smoke, you know, even feel like I'm sure different animals feel differently, like developing sure. that feel. How, how often are you experimenting just with your processes? All the time. I mean, it's every day. So my head pit master, Ryan Berg, he, he comes to me, came to me last week and says the chickens, he didn't think the chicken had as much flavor as it did six months ago. So we changed one of our processes and he actually created it and came up with the idea and he tested it and he brined it. And basically we brine our chicken and some hot sauce and it's a little secret we can tell you, but we brine it in hot sauce. Wow. And um, he brined it for too long, but he wanted to brine it longer than what I was doing. I was only doing it for an hour and he took it a little longer and we've met in the middle and it, 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 it had, it had so much flavor. I mean, he did, it was an idea. He came out of nowhere and said, Hey, we need to do something because chicken sometimes can be, it can change more than anything, I think, because it's blah to begin with. And if it gets really blah, then we have to add a little more flavor to it. And that's one thing that we, we've we adjusted recently. How proud does that make you as a leader oh. to see somebody that, you know, you've trained, but now, like, I don't want to say the, you know, the, the student has become the master, but, like, he's learning. And he's not just repeating the things that you've shown him, but yeah. he's starting to create his own processes or, or have his own thoughts. Yeah. Like, that's got to be absolutely so rewarding. It's awesome. And, and Ryan, and he's a great he's a great chef or a great cook by, on his own right. So, I mean, he could go do it on his own somewhere easily. And he's it's just, uh, I'm just happy to, he's my head pit master and he works with me. All right. And he's fun. He's a great dude. He's out mushroom hunting right now. Uh, he's been, he's a morel freak and he's out mushroom hunting. Where at? Oh, he won't ever tell anybody where he's at. He'll send me oh, videos, okay. but okay. He's, he's out. I think he's out towards uh, 
a flat river somewhere today, but he'll send me videos and of just little figurines by mushrooms and just crazy stuff. But he, he's addicted to mushroom hunting and loves it. And he, he buys them and he comes in and cooks them for the people at the restaurant. We eat them in the kitchen. I was going to say, are we going to start seeing some more morels? I, I would like to. He, he talked about doing something. This We were talking about doing something like a, maybe a smoked duck and morel. So something different. That, uh, yeah. One more reason. We've already given like six, but one more reason to follow Porky Bud. So yeah, like no, if a smoked duck and morels show up, I'm in. Well, that'll be a Ryan Berg special because he's been hitting me up about it because I love smoking duck. All right. Two more questions and then we get you out of here. What is one thing that you think most diners don't understand about the restaurant industry that you wish they did understand? Cool. That's a tough one. Diners don't understand. I think just the customer, I think they have need to have more patience with customers. And I think some people are so forceful and like it's our way or no way. And I think people don't listen to customers as much. And we try to listen to every customer that comes in, whether good or bad, or I think that's the relationship with customers and with social media being so impactful. Now I think diners need to do a better job of, you know, not catering to the customer, but listen to the customer. And I think that's one of the issues we have. Okay. And then favorite part. I mean, you've, you've been a part of competition barbecue. Now you're in the restaurant industry. So I'll just, it doesn't necessarily have to just be restaurant, but just food in general. What is your favorite part of just being a food professional? Like food is such a huge part of your life. Yeah. I think the biggest thing in mind is just when you create something new and you bite into it and you just, you know, whether it's me or Ryan or my head kitchen guy or staff at the restaurant, just when you create something new and exciting and you hit that mark that you, you kind of envision in your head. And then when you bite into it, there's not a better feeling and you're proud of it. And then you put it out there for other people to try. And then they come and tell you how great it is. And I mean, it's awesome hearing that, you know, people just over and over. I mean, yeah, there's some bad ones every now and then, but it's just, there's not a better feeling than clicking on OFL and seeing, you know, hundred people commenting on, you know, the beef rib or the Mayan or it's just, it's a cool feeling. Uh -huh. So that's probably the most fulfilling thing in the restaurant business. All right, people. I I mean, you, you probably already knew Blaine's credentials coming in. You probably tasted his food. I mean, Porky Butts is an extremely popular restaurant. But if you haven't, this is your siren call. Get in there. Give this a try. If you can get your hands on the beef rib and you have the ability to ingest a pound of meat, go for it because it's worth it. But the burn ends, the ribs, the chicken, the turkey. turkey. I mean, you can go down the roster. There's all kinds of good options, whatever you're looking for. Blaine, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Maybe after we have another pandemic, we can have you come on again. But yeah. until then, this was fantastic. And I'm so appreciative of you taking your time. I know that you're a busy guy, especially during graduation season. Yeah, it's getting crazy coming up. I appreciate you having me on. And I just, yeah, I did want to tell people to get out and support barbecue in Omaha, whether it's me, whether it's, you know, Smoke and Barrel, whether it's Jay's or, you know, all the other ones are out there. The mission, the new place that just opened, just get out and support barbecue. And one thing I tell people in Omaha that I think it just drives me nuts is you don't have to hate me to like somebody else. I mean, Carrie Bringle said that once and you can like all of them. You can eat one thing in my restaurant and still like some at one of the other restaurants, but just get out and support barbecue in Omaha and keep, thank you for what you do for the barbecue community here in Omaha and keep uh, pushing the live fire cooking. Of course. Will do. Omaha, as always, thanks for eating with us.